My dad often visits Africa for his work and when he comes back he sometimes gives us some kind of tiny gifts, especially when we were young. About 10 years ago he came back and he gave me this. This here is a block of natural rubber, which is, as weird as it sounds, tapped from the rubber tree. It's a resource that had a significant influence on the history of Africa and more specifically the Congo. This video is, as you might have guessed, not a psychology video as usual, but it's a video that I've been wanting to do for quite some time. It's a video about history and it's a pretty bad yet unknown history. A history in which millions of African natives died. And it all happened because of one man, King Leopold II of Belgium. Before I start, I just want to warn you, this video might contain some graphic images. And also, if you're wondering, how much do you hate your kid if you give him a block of rubber? It's okay, I've also gotten regular presents. This was just something which he had received when visiting a rubber plant. That being said, welcome to Brains Applied. In 1865, Leopold II, the eldest surviving son of King Leopold I, was crowned as the new king of Belgium. He was an ambitious man who wanted to increase the power and wealth of the tiny new found nation. Belgium, after all, was very small in comparison to its baguette und bratwurst neighbors and had only existed for 34 years. To expand the Belgian Empire, Leopold had been looking at Asia and South America, but these continents were already very much colonized. The most unexplored parts of the world were Africa and Antarctica. The last one obviously wasn't very interesting since its only resources are ice, penguins and snow, but Africa seemed kind of promising, although only the coasts had been explored. So Leopold set up a conference with geographers and business people and explorers to discuss the exploration of Africa. The official reason was to improve science and to stop the Afro-Arabic slave trade which was still very present in Africa. But many people close to Leopold, they knew the real reason. The conference resulted in the foundation of Leopold's Association Internationale Africaine to further his cause. And soon after that, Leopold learned that Henry Morton Stanley, the famous explorer, had finished his journey in which he crossed Africa. As he was the first Western person to explore Central Africa, Leopold hired him to go back and start outposts in the name of Belgium. Stanley was obviously very happy to return for a new expedition, so funded by Leopold's money, he returned and bought plots of lands for outposts from local chieftains, by spoiling them with gifts and also by letting them sign legal paperwork which was definitely very comprehensible to people that never saw paper before. However, the Belgians merely owned little bits of land in Central Africa, and explorers from other countries, such as France, were eager to follow in their footsteps. As to avoid bitch fights between explorers, several nations decided that it was time to make official decisions about Africa. So in 1884, Germany Austria-Hungary, Denmark, Spain, the United States, France, the UK, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Russia, Sweden, Norway and the Ottoman Empire gathered at the Berlin Conference. Important to know is that Leopold and his association wanted a colony, but the Belgian government didn't since they thought it would be a liability. So after Pinky promising that they wouldn't ask the government for help, Financially or otherwise, Leopold was allowed to join the Berlin Conference to get a nice plot of land for his association. And after some debating, the countries at the Berlin Conference permitted Leopold to start his own nation in Central Africa, under two conditions. Free trade had to be supported for the countries that were present at the conference, and Leopold had to fight the African Arab slave trade. And that's how the Congo Free State was founded. 
controlled by the International African Association, of which Leopold was chairman. The new country was now safe from other countries, and slowly more parts of the land were explored, but the expansion was costly while the returns were basically non-existent. They couldn't export enough ivory as killing elephants and cutting off their tusks apparently isn't a good way to grow more elephants and more ivory. And taxes in the form of money couldn't be demanded from a population that never owned money in the first place. From 1876 to 1885, before his state was founded, Leopold had already invested 10 million Belgian francs while earning merely 75,000 francs. By 1890, Leopold had invested 19 million francs, which, according to my calculations, equals 678 million euros in today's money. And he was close to bankruptcy. Leopold had no other option than going to the Belgian government for support. Of course, the government wasn't too happy about this because pinky promises are sacred after all. But it would be really embarrassing to let your king go bankrupt, so they decided to give Leopold a loan of 25 million francs and later on an additional 7 million francs. On the condition that if the financial situation wouldn't improve, Congo would become a Belgian colony. And then the jungle country went bananas. To maximize profits, Leopold decided that all ground that was not used by the locals would become property of the state, including the resources that could be found on these grounds. On paper, free trade was still allowed as was demanded by the Berlin Conference. However, Leopold's orders meant that the locals couldn't hunt and sell ivory or farm new lands without robbing the state. This was very, very problematic because the natives used what is called extensive agriculture. Extensive agriculture means that instead of using and reusing the same grounds over and over again with fertilizer and all those kind of things to maximize the returns, you move your fields from area to area to area to area and this allows you to use the best fields each time while the soil of the old fields can recover. But due to Leopold's new rules, this wasn't possible. Leopold now had a massive amount of land, but what was he going to do with it? One event changed everything. In 1888, the Scot John Boyd Dunlop had invented the inflatable rubber tire, a product that massively improved the comfort of cars and bikes, a product that skyrocketed the demand for rubber. This was Leopold's golden chance. Now of course he couldn't exploit all this land by himself, so he handed out licenses for an area of about half the country to several companies such as the Anversoise and the Anglo-Belgian Indian rubber companies. Companies in which Leopold himself coincidentally was a major stakeholder. And all of a sudden he was sitting on a gold mine. Do you remember how I said that you couldn't really ask monetary taxes from a population that never used money? Taxes were now to be paid in the form of rubber, and they were collected by either Leopold's army or the private militias of the rubber companies. Native men with barely any training and obviously armed with guns and machetes. They were paid according to the amount of collected rubber, following the principle no rubber, no pay. And I think you can see now where this is going. It went awfully wrong. Women were held hostage while their men had to look for rubber. They were sexually abused and handing in too little rubber was punishable by death. Oh, and a casual whipping or the burning of entire villages wasn't that rare either. Nowadays, the Congo Free State is especially known for chopping off hands. And this did indeed happen, but mostly because the white leaders wanted to make sure that their soldiers didn't use their bullets to hunt. The bullets had to be imported from Europe. And since Amazon and Next Day Delivery didn't exist yet, they were very expensive. So for each bullet that was used, soldiers had to return a chopped off hand. 
but punishing living people by cutting off their hands didn't occur that often. The idea that it happened everywhere mostly originates from the pictures that were spread throughout Europe. But it did happen in some cases. For example, some soldiers chopped off the hands of living people without killing them so that they could use the bullets for other reasons. Over time, the situation only became worse. At the time, there were no rubber plants. The natives had to harvest all the rubber in the jungle. And due to the unrealistic demands, they had to go deeper and deeper into the jungle each single time. And although the law only allowed them to work at most 40 hours per month for the state, they did have to work much harder while having no time and energy to work on the fields. Which didn't have a high yield in the first place because Leopold had claimed almost all their land. If the natives weren't killed by the state, they would die of hunger, hardship and diseases. There is no clear estimate of the amount of people that died during this period of time because there were no official population statistics and Leopold had his archives destroyed. But the official estimation by the Belgian government is that 10 million people lost their life. Which is almost the same body count as during the Holocaust. Most violence in this organization came from the lower soldiers who were natives. But it wasn't just them who were to blame. Sources tell us that Leopold had heard of the atrocities and although he didn't want them to happen in his land, he neglected to consider the fact that his system was causing everything. And he did appoint the European leaders who were responsible for these soldiers. Some of these leaders even actively engaged in those killings. There was for example René de Permontier, an officer who had all the bushes and trees around his house cut down so that he could shoot people from his porch. Or Léon Vivier, an officer who had already killed 572 people within 4 months of his arrival. From the start there had been reports about how natives were treated, but it wasn't until the British diplomat Roger Casement wrote a report in 1904 that the international pressure rose. And in 1908, the king handed over the Congo Free State to Belgium, making it an official colony. From there on, the situation in the Congo improved, theoretically. The reality seems to say otherwise. During his time, Leopold used his income to fund massive infrastructure projects in Belgium until his death on the 17th of December 1909, aged 74. The entire affair was swept under the carpet and the brutal officers just returned to their motherland, without ever being punished. Of Léon Vivier we know for example that he died in 1939 as a decorated war hero. Until today, the Belgian government has never apologized for what happened under Leopold's reign and the question is whether they ever will, since Congo was Leopold's private country. Do you think the Belgian government should apologize? Let me know in the comments. And that's all I wanted to tell you today. Now before you leave, I want to thank you. I'm almost reaching thousand subscribers and I would like to thank everyone who has watched my videos and everyone who has supported me. So thank you. And I will see you guys later.